Hi everyone, my name is Dan Gunner and today I'm here to present to you Consider the Data Source, A Journey Through an Industrial Attack. Disclaimer up front on this, the, there are a few companies, brands, and trademarks in here. The views are completely my own and all information is used at your own risk. So every information security journey really starts with preparation. And when you think about it, preparation is the calm before the storm. Um, when you're dealing with an event or with an intrusion. Um, and during preparation, there's, there's tons of different controls you can do. There's things like host and network monitoring, data centralization, um, all of those standard things we're used to. There's offensive analysis and stim simulation, red teaming, penetration testing, all of the other similar services there. Um, and you know, there's the process side too. So security is people process technology, um, but all of this makes up really that range of events you can do during preparation. Um, but at some point, you know, stuff's going to happen. And when stuff does happen, you know, preparation is still worth it. You have to be ready, though, for, hey, there's a lot you can plan for. There's things you can model. There's approaches that you can kind of run through um, and scenarios you can run through. Um, but there's never certainty that that's going to cover what, you know, the full scope of what you think it will. Um, this is a quote from a while back, right? Um, but, you know, it's, it's held true whether it's been something digital or whether it's something now. Um, you can plan for kind of that first encounter, but once you get past that first encounter, there's always going to be those unknowns and those details um, that'll catch you by surprise. And so, you know, it's kind of easy to say as you're planning for that first kind of for that first iteration to say, OK, well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to put all of my eggs in this basket. Right. I'm going to, you know, come up, really focus on this one control and just kind of stick with that because, hey, you know, no matter what I do to prepare, um, it doesn't matter. Um, there's also a risk, though, to not always constantly improving or to doing that, because, you know, while there is risks and cost to action, I mean, you're risking sometimes your reputation, you could be risking your job if you get breached and someone gets fired over it. Um, but in the long run, you know, there's really this belief that, you know, far less or the, the risks of long range fixing things um, is actually less than the risks of not doing anything. Um, particularly in our space, right? I mean, there have been industrial intrusions for a while. On the screen is really just a handful um, of even the ones we know about. There's a lot of intrusions that likely we don't know about, we haven't heard about. Either companies have kept it in for reputation um, or just honestly, we don't know about it. It was never detected. Um, and, you know, sometimes, um, so stuff can happen. And sometimes literal stuff can happen. I mean, here's an example that some people talk about if you've been around the community for a while, um, but others don't know about this. So back in 2000 in Maruchi Shire, um, there was an inside threat. Um, he, this uh, person wasn't happy because um, they weren't hired um, for a position. There was some kind of some um, employment drama between them. And, you know, with his technical knowledge and with his abilities, he actually ended up doing a series of wireless, a series of RF attacks um, against this public sewage. It ended up spilling sewage a lot of places. Um, this ended up in kind of a knife fight actually between him and other operators on site that we'll talk about um, a little later, some of the outcomes for that. But really what happened is, you know, he, he had the equipment, he had the knowledge to access this system remotely so what he would do is drive um you know he was driving up to different sites um connecting wirelessly there was some stuff and if you read through the court documents there was stuff that he had to know to actually connect um, his inside knowledge did help some um, but what's interesting when you look through this is actually you know the knife fight portion was you know through this network he was using uh the legitimate applications to generate the traffic well they'd be like, okay, well, this traffic's coming from site 14. Um, and so he would emulate, okay, I'm going to configure this hot, my, my software to pretend to be site 14 and mess with the pumps. Um, 
And so an operator was like, hey, this isn't right. Someone might be messing with us. Well, they changed to site three. Um, in changing to site three, they noticed, hey, well, the actual plants now, um, you know, site three is now trying to do it. And I still have this rogue site 14 off in the corner. Um, how this was actually, and you know, what's interesting there is that's kind of really the first known example of where we see an operator that's actually, um, you know, detecting these events. Um, but this is all to say that stuff literally happens in this domain. Um, and it has for a while. I mean, 2000 is 21 years ago, if you do the simple math there. So um, this is all to say that response is inevitable. And this isn't to, I mean, I'm not saying this to sound hopeless. I'm saying that in today's world, there's not an if. Um, you don't control the if and you don't control the when. But what you can control if you're on the defense side of this is how fast you can detect it and how fast you can respond to it. Um, and so we're going to really focus on those two areas as we talk through the attack. There are many models um, for, uh, for modeling attacks. Um, one of the popular or an adversary actions, one of the popular ones and hot ones today we're going to use is MITRE ATT&CK. Um, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with MITRE ATT&CK for the people that might not be. What it is, is MITRE ATT&CK breaks down adversary tactics and techniques <clears throat> into a series of buckets. So what they do is they've taken events in the past, modeled them out and tried to kind of cluster the activity or the intent um, throughout the whole attack cycle. Um, so attack, definitely Google it, look it up. Um, it's a pretty big knowledge base there um, that you can use. What recently happened specific to the industrial community was the Triton evaluation. So for those not familiar with Trisis and Triton, um, there was a breach into a uh, Middle Eastern oil site um, that compromised the safety system, um, you know, a year or two back, year, maybe three years um, back. Um, what MITRE did, and MITRE does these attack valuations where they bring in different vendor products. Um, they um, run the same scenario through them. There's technically no winner, but what they do do what they do is publish out the results to kind of show, hey, you know, here's kind of this central MITRE created scenario, um, and here's what we saw each of the tools. Um, they don't declare a winner. They say, hey, you should. Or you, it's up for people to decide basically how people do. Um, and so what MITRE did here is they calculated or they, uh, they emulated the behaviors of what was known about um, that intrusion into that Middle Eastern and, um, uh, gas and oil site. And how they did this is they, they had real hardware doing this. So they set up the control system. It was a Rockwell control system, uh, the burner management environment. The graph you see there is from the MITRE site. Um, they set up the control system components there, and they did simulate some of the physical process. So obviously, they, might, they weren't um, producing barrels of oil, I don't think. But what they were doing, they had the real software connected to a simulator there to try to get you know as accurate as you can within you know a reasonable budget um, while still exercising those security tools what you have there what this shows is that bingo card and again we talked about attack being that the collection of tactics and techniques um, you know this is kind of that bingo card and green is what they exercised and we'll talk through different ones of these shortly. Um, but as you can see, they picked really a portion of um, the attack tactics, tactics and techniques to choose against this. You know, as we get into the scenario of what they emulated, and again, this was based on that trisis flow. If you look at the link at the bottom of this slide, um, it talks through, um, you know, how they drew out this scenario. Um, we're going to start from the attacker point of view. So as a defender, you might catch the initial compromise as the root into it. Chances are, as a defender, you'll see later on. We're going to go with the attacker perspective just because it's more chronological. Um, and so the, one of the early things that they that MITRE emulated through this was an attacker using you know, valid credentials that they stole, right? So maybe they spearfished these, maybe they got these um, 
um, through watering hole, through other means. But what they did is they jumped from the enterprise side into the industrial side of the plant. They used RDP over 3389, pretty common. Um, this can still be enabled at a lot of sites. A lot of people allow this over the firewall still. Um, and they said as this, that it is you know, standard operating behavior. Um, what they did with this was they did a program upload, um, save some files, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more in there. You know, one of the first things that we're going to point out as we look at this and the importance of data is out of the bat, you might say, hey, well, you know, going from one network trust zone to another, um, maybe I can just do this with baselines, right? Um, it's RDP. Um, and, and that's true. Baselines can be helpful, um, but it depends on those thresholds, right? Um, do you get a lot of RDP um, from the box A to box B? If box A has no reason to talk to box B, then yeah, that's a really good baseline. Um, you know, if box A though is an engineering station and box B is a jump or an engineer station on the corporate network, and box B is actually the jump server inside, you know, it's going to be harder to just do a, you know, matter of fact, well, an engineer talked to a jump host. Okay, cool. Was it done out of business hours? Was it done when that engineer was off shift? You know. Um, you know, you have to consider what actually is inside of that baseline and how you drive it. You know, after hours is actually really cool. And if you can find a way to get your shift schedule into there, you can get better baselines, right? And what I mean by getting your shift schedule in is trying to remove it to where you can do it human-wise, you're going to have problems scaling. Um, but if you can get your baselines better by, hey, let me go ahead and import a CSV of my operator schedules, um, you can begin to get better baselines. And this is where it can be futile, other, futile otherwise, because if, if the attacker is acting within that mathematical baseline or within the logical, the logic of that baseline, you're going to struggle with this. And you know, an, another important thing to say on this is, and we'll see this later in there, is um, Host sources can provide details that the network sources can't see. This is a really important takeaway from the MITRE ATT&CK eval as we push through, um, and definitely something you should investigate both from MITRE's results, um, but also just as you evaluate products and look through what people are doing. When we talk about data sources today, we're going to really talk about three areas. We're going to, or three different types. Um, this is how we're bucketing them. We're going to talk about process network data. This is a lot of, when you look at the industrial market, what you see, so passive network analysis. This includes people that are doing kind of NetFlow style summarizations, your five tuple of you know, source and desk, IP and port, and then protocol, um, including down into some of the summarizations. So when you get into looking deeper into the protocol, process network data is that really efficient way of um, you know digging into um, some of the fields that they decide to extract why it's the process side as the vendors decided like hey you know we're going to write logic on this field or and it might not be a vendor a vendor or open source product decided hey let's summarize this specific field in the protocol when we talk about process network data the efficiency here is analysis and storage um, there's only so much processing power um, that you have, and especially as you, you know, ruggedize a box and you push it forward in a plant, you know, you can't often have racks and racks of servers looking at a single tap point. At some point, um, you know, you have to, you have to cut data down. Um, and the storage size too, obviously storage also can take up quite a few racks um, if it's not processed data, depending on the flow of that. The con on, on this is encryption. So, you know, with the 3389 and with T, like TLS with HTTPS, um, if the data is actually encrypted, you can see the fact of communications, um, but it's going to limit you later on if you actually want to see what was communicated, what was the context inside of it, um, and also protocol support. So, like we said, for summarization, it can depend on you know, how deep and what, um, you know, in a protocol that's actually pulled out that the logic's written on. 
Um, protocol support is really important, and especially in the industrial field when you're dealing with very proprietary protocols, some that are known about and the whole spec might not be known, um, or there might be you know, protocols with products that you don't even know about um, and vendors don't talk about much. Um, process host data is the next one, right? So this is things that come off your endpoint agent collection. This could be things like Windows host logs. This could be things like, uh, you know, AV logs, your endpoint protection, um, application logs, really anything you can pull off the disk. Where this is processed again is it's a log source. So, um, you know, there might be some filtering in there, like you filter on the network side to extract out the data of interest. Um, so again, the pro here is it's not network events. And what I mean by that, and I don't mean to that sound like a really vague inverse of network data. What it is, is you can begin to see like, hey, here's information on, here's a processes command line. You're not going to see that on the network. Here's, you know, other, uh, other um, you know, file or process met metadata um, when you look like sys internals and other tools. Um, some of the cons here are configuration. So when you get into host data, as the number of hosts grow, you kind of have this maintenance tail that you have to deal with. Um, and also making sure that your configuration um, and even managing your configuration can be a challenge. Um, and then integrity, right? Um, so, you know, when you're listening to data over tap point, there are things an attacker can do to try to screw with the data you're getting. Um, with host data, if the attacker is on the host, um, indicator removal is its own actual MITRE um, ICS TTP attack ICS TTP there. Um, so with host data, you do have to consider, hey, is, or is rootkitting involved? Am I hooked somewhere? Um, what are the issues? Is this data I'm getting the true data or could it be manipulated? Um, third data source we'll talk through is, or we'll use as raw host and net network data. Unlike its process friends, this is your packet capture, your disk and memory image. The pro on this is it's not filter limited. So you're not getting the opinion of the, uh, you know, open source project or of the vendor of what they decided to put in there. Um, the con on here, we talked about the processing space and, um, you know, um, but yeah, the processing capacity and disk space needed. Um, the con here is you do need a mature analysis pipeline because the more data you bring in, you have to be ready to um, efficiently deal with that. Um, that is kind of the pro con of not dealing with filtered data, but the real pro again, to go back to that is there's a lot more analysis opportunities as you dig into that. So digging farther into MITRE, into the MITRE eval, um, starting with initial compromise, and more than network data is often needed to dissect behavior is the takeaway here. Um, the criteria down at the bottom, so the criteria to score on this MITRE point was seeing TCP 3389. So again, you know, if we talk about process network data towards the top of the slide, that's something I can see. Um, I'm going to see that TCP on UDP traffic potentially. Um, and I might see the username with RDP. Um, you can get the RDP cookie that sometimes includes username, um, depending on if the um, network tool you're using is actually extracting that. And you actually have to see a certain part of the um, RDP handshake to get that. Um, that can answer the first part of scoring. But to completely have scored on this, uh, you actually had to have the second part, which is you know, via the MS, uh, via that specific process and having the user may or may not be present. This is where the network data helps, but you need that host data to say, okay, here's the process information. Here's the login record with my, with the username. Um, if you go through the MITRE results, you'll see some of that in there. Um, third one on there, raw host and network. You can, of course, pull this out of memory, out of disk, out of the PCAP. Um, it's also going to be there, um, but again, you're going to have to, um, you know, be dealing with a tool that either processes that for you efficiently, um, or it might take you a bit of time, um, or you keep, if you're doing it manually, you're going to have to keep the number of boxes you're doing on it low. 
as we get outside of initial compromise and we start to talk about persistence, um, I'm not going to go through every step of the miter of uh, the attack. We actually only chose the few that we wanted to talk about to really bring out some salient points on this. Um, but for employing persistence, what was done in the attack value eval was installing a scheduled task. Um, and then what this scheduled task did was initiated a re reverse shell. Um, and they did this SSH reverse shell over port 445. Um, why they did this was to get past firewalls. So if a firewall is not actually application aware, if it's just doing it off the port number, um, this would get past it. Um, they were trying to guise it as SMB traffic, and we'll talk about this in a minute. When we hop into this, um, you know, let's go into the first criteria, right? So a scheduled task was created. It's not legitimate. It was imported into the task manager. For to score on this and the MITRE attack eval, you would not have gotten this point, right? If you were just going off process network data. Um, and this is where I think MITRE actually does a pretty good job because if you, you can look through now the results and say, okay, well, who's actually processing host data? Um, the link at the bottom actually, I'll point out, um, should point you straight to this employee persistence um, to where you can see how the different vendors did. But in this case, to score here, it's like, wait, okay, um, who's looking at Sysmon file create? A lot of the vendors that scored on this were using Sysmon file create, or they were doing some type of command line analysis. Command line analysis coming out of the fact that the Windows event logs do give you the command line. Uh, all of the competitors were scored out of Windows, um, out of the Windows event logs. Um, again, this is where raw host and network data comes in. But it, it raises a question. It really, you know, brings through the point. What if no network data is generated by the tactic? Um, definitely something to consider. Um, and also something to consider here is, you know, if all you're responding with is network data, um, how are you going to see this, right? And what I mean by that is, okay, cool. I have a network alert, um, you know, maybe from initial compromise, maybe from a later step. Well. I'm going to want to correlate this persistence. And so how do I correlate this persistence to that network event that I got on either side of this tactic? Um, the approach that I offer for this and the approach that MITRE showed is definitely consider those Windows event logs. The point we want to show here is low collection diversity creates blind spots. Like we said, to correlate the whole stream of attack, you're going to need window or you're going to need network and host data. <laughs> and you're, you're going to need to, um, the process and capability to um, be able to analyze that. Moving on. So we talked about that reverse shell being created um, and it going over port 445 um, and that passing the firewall rules. This is something to where you might see it on the network side, right? So there is an app layer mismatch. Um, Suricata, one of the attack um, participants caught it via Suricata rule. Um, you might catch this by just saying, hey, I'm looking at the protocol going over this port and it doesn't look like SMB. Um, it looks like SSH. Um, that might have caught it at the process network data level. Um, on the host side, the Windows event logs and specifically what was scored in here was event 4672. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's where the participants found it in here. Um, again, you can do it with raw, and, um, raw host and network. Um, there's a lot you can do there. Um, again, the same sc um, scaling issues apply, but this is where details matter because, you know, this might be a weak signal where you're like, hey, I get a whole lot of app layer mismatches on my network side. And in hindsight, I can see, okay, yeah, this was part of persistence, but you have to be ready to deal with, okay, you know, what's my threshold of dealing with app layer mismatches if I'm just using network security or if I'm using both or network data or if I'm using both network and host data, I can say, hey, there's a mismatch and there's this really weird command line down here. Um, you know, that's that might be a more that might be a better threshold where you're like, hey, this clearly isn't right. You know, another example where details matter is when we got into collection and discovery or when you look at the collection discovery on here. So again, 
an attacker used a custom executable for a scale scan on the network. Um, 44818 is a port associated with Rockwell, um, for those not familiar with Rockwell. Um, and what they were doing here was uh, identifying devices talking uh, ENIP, um, which is the protocol that these devices talk. So they did this multiple hours to limit detection. Um, in process network data, right, your baseline, again, going to the baseline threshold thing, the baseline threshold might have helped you here. Um, the other interesting thing to point out here and a little Trisis knowledge and where MITRE um, did a good job evaluating uh, or uh, emulating Trisis was uh, the attackers did use uh, what's called PI installer, PI DXE. Basically, it's a way to turn Python scripts into cross-platform capable um, binaries. Um, you can, if you look at the file the metadata going over the wire of how PyDEXE and Py Installer works, um, there's you can there are YAR rules and there are Suricata rules out there um, to look for these flying over the network. So, in dealing with this in process network data space, that's definitely something to look for, um, and a detail that certainly matters there. Um, on the host on the host um, data side, again, this is one to where command lines can be super important. Um, you might do actually a baseline of command line deviations. In this case, if logicsmaps.exe is an existing good binary and you know the command lines that are normally run with that, if the command line changes um, and the bit network behavior changes, um, you know that might be in a more advanced threshold that you decide to go out and look at it. Um, when you go down to the raw host and network data side, we talked about Yara for processed. This would be the same deal. If you pull a hard drive Im or if you pull a disk image or if you uh, pull files out of memory and start running Yara against it, um, you know, if the process is running, you might actually catch, um, you might catch this tactic, um, you know, also in raw disk that way. Um, but this is another case where details really do matter because again it's you know here's a here's a binary that's named uh, or binary name that i accept but wait it's pi installer where's pi installer used um there are vendors out there um there are industrial vendors that are using python um i don't know of many using pi installer or pi dxd at this point um and so that's where there's you know kind of those baselines or um, opportunities to apply detail to it. As we move on, um, you know, details at that network level don't just matter. As we get into expanding access, um, here an attacker, um, you know, did SCP over 2223 um, to move some tools. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, yeah. And so when we talk about process network data, our challenge here is going to be um, the data is encrypted. So there is the protocol mismatch. Again, if you understand enough of the protocol going over port 2223, you might catch it that way. You're not going to see the file contents. So like the Suricata and YAR rule here won't work as much. Um, on the process host data side, and this was interesting to my, to the attack eval, there were a ton of file creation events. I know, hold on uh, what you might be thinking on that, um, but file creation events are there. And if you look through the results, you'll see a lot of file creation events were created. On the raw side, you'll see a lot of, uh, or you could do this via file metadata. Um, let's go back to that file creation events. Um, certainly depending on the size of your network and depending on the capability of your collection stack and your ability to analyze that um, file creation events are definitely interesting that being said you have to filter them because the next question on that is can you track every file and registry right to this system without being flooded um, again certainly um, it's it's valuable to bring those logs in it's certainly valuable to log those but you need to consider that those baselines and thresholds that you say, hey, wait, this file write shouldn't happen here. Maybe it's a file write to um, a weirdly named directory, directory. Maybe it's a file write to something like C, Windows, you know, System32. That would definitely be um, potentially a weird file write. Um, but, you know, context things like that, because 
tracking every file and registry, right, won't scale. You're going to flood yourself out with that. Um, where, where, you know, what is important is, and we've said this a few times throughout, you know, as you, as you turn up your automation and as you dig your baselines deeper, um, you know, you're going to need context to scale. Scale requires context. Um, some of this can be done on the industry level. Some of this might be done specific down to your plant level, but at the end of the day to scale this um, and to really detect um, sophisticated adversary like was seen in Trisis in this, that scale is going to require context. Um, and, and even that, that context might not just be technical context. So as we moved into infecting the safety system control logic, um, in this case, um, you know, an adversary initiated a program upload action. Um, and for those not familiar, program uploads and downloads are actually um, a little counterintuitive to people first in the industry. So an upload is actually going from a programmable logic device to your computer. Um, in the challenge you can see here, they did it between the safety PLC and the safety EWS. Um, a download is actually pushing the program logic from the engineering workstation is what an EWS is. It's pushing it from the engineer, a download's pushing the engineering workstation to the programmable logic controller. Um, in this case, right, we have two boxes that should be communicating this really, right? So the, the engineering workstation, it's probably in the established thresh threshold that it should be talking to a PLC. Um, so in process network data, you're going to see this file upload, at least in this case, you will. So this use the, the protocol Rockwell uses is called SIP. Um, SIP, you can buy this spec. There's also versions of the spec that float around the internet. Um, this is a known protocol. Not all devices will you know the protocols used for um, file uploads. Some of the advantages of some of the vendors is um, they do actually dissect some of these very proprietary protocols. A lot of the major vendors do have support on this, but you know you might see on process network data, you might see evidence of the proprietary file upload command. Um, in this case, again, it might not trigger a threshold because these are computers that should talk it, um, you know, but maybe you have multiple thresholds. Maybe this happened in the middle of the night when engineers aren't there. Maybe you're doing more correlation on there. Um, where this is also helpful can again be and where people were scoring on this and the challenge is the Windows event logs with the process information. Um, and when you get down into this, some of this does begin to get into getting into packet captures with the industrial traffic. Um, this does, you know, depending on the protocol, again, you might need reverse engineering skills. You might need to figure out what the protocol actually looks for and do things like writing a Lua or, um, you know, a Lua dissector for Wireshark or other things if you're trying to do this manually. Um, but in this case, too, the point to prove here is outside validation might be required. Um, an easier thing is to just say, Hey, engineering team, we saw a program upload go between, you know, this is kind of weird, you know, or, you know, we thought this was kind of weird. Did you do this? Um, and you can say, and they might say, oh, well, no, we weren't there. Um, and you can double check that with, you know, closed circuit TV. If it's, if it's a monitored site, um, you know, door access readers, you can do it actually with the windows event logs of who, who logged in when and trace it down. If someone on vacation did it, um, it, you know, either their account's compromised or it's not them. Um, but the point here is outside validation might be required to prove these out with certainty. Um, you know, moving into the last two steps of what we'll talk about today, um, protocol depth doesn't matter until it does. And when we get into the disabling the safety function, again, we are in very specific operations, very specific tags or data fields within the device. Um, in process network data, when we're dealing with, uh, you know, in this case, it's an adversary initiating a write tag action. They're writing to a very specific um, part in memory of that device with a very specific value. To get down to this level, um, you have to do deep packet inspection of the protocol. In this case, it was a SIP and Ethernet IP. 
Um, again, it's important to understand um, the protocols in your environment and what um, you actually have visibility over. Because even if you take a big product line like a, you know, Honeywell Experion, like a, um, Emerson Delta V or Emerson Innovation, there's a lot of protocols. And so just saying like, hey, we cover, we cover this product line. No, you need to know like, hey, does this product line, is this product line the one that does my program uploads? Is this product line, you know, or yeah, is this protocol the one that does my program uploads? Is this protocol the one that's writing tags to the device? Um, and even what's enabled on the device, right? So, you know, I've worked with devices to where both ENIP was enabled and Modbus. So, you know, even if you're watching ENIP over here, I can do it via Modbus over here. And if you're not watching, you're not going to see it. Um, so understanding the deep packet inspection to understand these rights to tags is very, very, very important. Um, this is a case where host data, um, a process host data isn't going to help you. Um, so some of the vendors do use the application logs. If they use the Windows API for logging, you might be able to go into the uh, Windows event logs, uh, into the application log or um, into the logs they write to and find that. Um, you can certainly do this with raw data, but or with raw um, packet capture. But again, you're going to need um, to either have a dissector to have a little bit of reverse engineering skills, um, depending um, on the protocol and how the tool was written. Um, but protocol depth does matter. Uh, finally, the last one that we'll talk about is really the last step. When you were looking at the ICS eval, this was on a burner management network. Um, these tag rights towards the end is actually how MITRE was emulating the um, effect on target phase of this. Um, towards the end, there was another um, group of tag rights that happened, um, very specific changes to the devices. Um, what we see here is air damper settings and cascade control removal. Again, process network data shines here. Um, assuming you have that deep packet inspection, and you can see the tag data. And you know what's interesting when you go through the uh, MITRE eval results on their site, MITRE does include the screenshots of what the vendors showed in their uh, in their UIs. Um, and you know it's definitely interesting because one of the things you can do is see, hey, well, what vendors were actually able to see the values that were written in and the tag names that they were written to. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely something when you look at MITRE to consider to do, or if you're just doing your own evaluation or process. Um, but in this case, even if you're not evaluating a product, um, to see this type of impact, um, you're going to need to go down here. So if, if you're doing it yourself, it's still important to say, okay, with whatever I'm home rolling to do this, I need to be ready to do this. Um, you could also do this with static and dynamic analysis as you're going through stuff. So throw it in a sandbox, throw it on your digital twin or range, or if you have a device. Um, but protocol depth at this point really does um, matter. And at first you might not say, well, you know, why would I care about this specific tag? And again, this goes back to filtering. Well, I'm going to filter out tag names because that's like, if I track every tag, there's no way I'll store this. That's right. And you know, that's right to a point. It's right to the point to where you need it, like in this case where, you know, the protocol depth does start to matter. You know, something we want to wrap up and something, you know, I want you to leave with with this is when you look at the ICS attack valve, it's really easy to enter this with hindsight bias. And, you know, Kahneman quote, hindsight bias makes surprises vanish. Um, what you see here on the right of the slide is uh, the SCADA system faults at Maruchi Shire, so that sewage plant that overflowed. Um, in a normal state, so before those February, before the January, February sites, this site had about two, two to four alarms a day um, was the average. When the insider started um, the wireless attack, they went from two to four events a day you know, up into 10, 15, 20, you know, you see a spike over 40 there. In addition, they were having pumps that weren't turning on. They were having pumps that are pumps not turning on when they should. They have pumps, um, you know, that were turning on when they shouldn't. There was a lot of weirdness. Um, 
And if you look in there, this unknown system faults the red, and it's about from January to the end of April, all of that time, there was a lot of weird going on. And there wasn't this correlation um, that this was that this was an insider that was uh, you know connecting in and causing these faults on there. Um, only when did only when that operator started getting suspicious and getting in that knife fight, um, you know, were they able to say, okay, well, we know this guy, we know he has the knowledge. Ultimately, they ended up, um, you know, suspecting it was that guy. They hired private investigators to follow him. Um, they found out he was actually parked near his sites. Uh, they sent the police in, arrested him, found the stuff in his car. Um, he was sentenced, uh, I think, to two years in jail and like a thirteen or fifteen thousand dollar fine, um, but you know it's a prime example of it's easy in hindsight bias to say, oh well, yeah, my threshold would have been there. Um, but in cases like this, um, you know, it really was the operator that saved the day, um, and it was a non, a non, um, you know, a non technical. Um, it was a non technical trigger that even caused. Um, you know, the due diligence to look at that. It's important to consider as you look across this where, um, you know, those alerts might come in and where those alerts that actually get you to, um, you know, figuring out where the event starts and how to respond to it. All of this at the end of the day, the success depends on detection of the chain of events. Um, you know, you might say, well, you know, we'll start with network because with network, I just have to find one of the links of the chain. And that's true. You, you might find some of the links of chain just going network. You might find some of the links of the chain just going disk. Um, but you have to have enough of the chain of events to properly isolate, to properly contain um, and eradicate. Um, because if you don't, um, you know, ultimately, you won't actually secure your network on that. Um, and the correlation of events, right? Um, if you can't correlate events together, like we saw, there were multiple steps where both host and network data was needed. Um, if you can't correlate, you're really going to struggle. Um, the right data is going to put the dumpster fire out quicker. And I put right in quotes um, because like, right, there's no solid definition to what the right data is. There's a lot of difference between networks, between plants, um, but not having the right data can limit your detection entirely. Um, you know, if you, if you don't have the data, like you can't, you can't collect data from the past that you didn't collect before. Um, you might have some metadata or other options, um, but I mean, um, you can't go back in the past and get data you never got. Um, so it's really important to consider both the host and network data that you use as you go across. How you can improve your success conditions, we offer kind of six steps or six recommendations for that. You know, what do you know about your environment and your visibility? How reliant are you on host only or network only? How deep are you going in the protocols? How do you know your devices, how they behave, how your operators work in the plant? Um, understanding the people process, the technology, the full scope of everything you do is really important because it's really hard to set good baselines if you don't understand yourself. Um, and you know you can work with um, you know you can work with a lot of people to try to do it, but ultimately you're going to know more about yourself than they will. Um, and then it goes into constantly improving, right? So how quickly can you dig into those data sources if you need to? Um, and if you find out you can't dig into those quickly, you need to go back into it or figure out how to solve that. Um, if if going through the MITRE ICS eval results. Um, you know, you say, ooh, yeah, we would not have seen that, or hey, you know, there's good opportunities here. Um, definitely use those preparation level things to improve before the event actually happens. Redundant sources, right? So, you know, we talked about host logs, the risk being that someone can mess with them, but, you know, you need to have redundant data sources to have that failure margin. Um, you know, I've been multiple places to where during an incident or before an incident, someone you know, lost their entire Splunk stack or they lost their entire seam. Um, you know, if you lose your entire seam or if you lose a part of what you're responding with or what your visibility is, you know, if you lose enough visibility or your network, you need to address that. You need to have situational awareness even through a failure margin. Um, 
the process side is designed for failure to a point. You need to design your security side for failure. Um, collecting the right data, like we said, you need to understand your collection limits. Um, um, you know, you might not be able to, you might have um, a very high throughput bandwidth channel. You might have, um, you know, collection challenges because it's out in the field and you can only use rugged options that don't that limit the uh, processing or collection power you have. You need to understand what right data is for you, both for how you analyze data and for the realities of your operations. Um, you need to understand your tool limits. So, you know, how you use your products, right? You know, every product's great when it's getting sold to you, but how are you actually using that for analysis and how does that make you better and fit in that overall strategy? Um, and then challenging your status quo, right? Look at your baselines, constantly validate them and check them, you know, use, you know, tabletop exercises, use red team assessments, use, you know, um, use the smart operators. I mean, we've had cases to where we've worked with customers and talked with them. Um, and, you know, just in a conversation with a customer on being like, well, how would you do this? You know, the whole chain of events and the whole chain of success starts with a five minute conversation because they know what the status quo of the environment is better. Always challenge the status quo, both, you know, of your technical, um, you know, of your, you know, technical stack, but also your baselines and how you do things. So the takeaway here, preparation matters. So it's not a panacea. It does accelerate response and it gets you to, you know, that faster mean time to detection, mean time to response, which is important. Um, but you need to also prepare for when you have to act. Um, silver bullets can breed complacency, right? It's important to validate that the tools that, you know, what you think your tools do actually do what they do and that you can use them in the way that they're being advertised to you. Response is inevitable, right? You don't choose if and when you respond, but you can control the speed, as we've said. Data diversity matters, right? We saw multiple cases to where both the host and network side was needed to um, to get to the conclusion or to, in the Meyer case, to actually score the point. Um, context is key, right? <coughs> Tracking every file, right? You won't, I mean, if, you, if it's a small network, you might be able to do that. Um, if it's a big network, you know, you're going to have a big storage bill. So if you're putting that up in AWS, it's going to be a big AWS bill. Um, you need to think about the data life cycle, though, around your data to say, okay, you know, let's store a file rights of this subset of data. Let's store command lines of this subset of data if they start to, and we'll store them for this long and this, you know, in this area. And, you know, this is how you'll access them, especially if you're using cloud, you can consider, well, we'll hot store these, cold store these, you know, you can go all day with the design on that. But at the end of the day, what it's important to do is not flood an analyst while also making sure that you're, um, you know, the analytics, if they're automated, are able to run over that corpus of data. Um, an analysis step doesn't matter until it does. You know, we talked about both the file context and the network context mattering. Um, analyzing sophisticated attackers are going to challenge some of your collection and analysis limits. Um, like we saw in the impact stage of MITRE attack, um, at, you had to dig deep in, deeper into the SIP protocol. Um, you know, as you take this kind of into the production world, it's going to be a challenge um, because, again, you're dealing with proprietary protocols, depending on how often tags are written, how often, um, you know, how often, how loud the network is. You know, you have things like you go into a refinery, it's not just one data bus, there's two data buses. Um, I've see, even seen even more complicated networks out there. Um, your analysis step and your breadth of analysis all matters. Um, and you should constantly be understanding and stretching those limits. So I wanna say thanks for attending the talk. Um, it was, it's really great. This is actually my first DEF CON talk to do. Um, and it's great to do it with ICS Village. Um, definitely stay in touch. Um, that's our Twitter. And if you want to work, to, or if you wanna to work together, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, there's always, fun stuff going on. So again, thanks and have a great rest of the day.